All right, I am really excited uh, to be here today with artist Monroe Eisenberg. His work is part of the Roundabout Reconsidering the Object in Space exhibition at the Delaware Contemporary on view now uh, through May. Monroe, thank you so much for joining us. We're excited to hear about your work today. Do you wanna tell us a little bit about who you are and what you've been doing? Sure, thanks for having me today, Brittany. Um, it's been a really nice experience working with you and um the, the other folks at the uh, Delaware Contemporary Museum and it, it's such a beautiful spot and it's so nice to be back in real space um yeah my name is Monroe Eisenberg I'm an interdisciplinary artist I work I have a foundation in sculpture uh deep comfort in wood and other types of materials but I've sort of since expanded into um different types of making and processes and, and thinking about um storytelling and and the things we make and how those things can tell different stories for different futures and uh, i'm deeply concerned with uh, the materiality of earth water air and and the transcendence of those those things and which also include forests and collective uh ways of being like ecosystems as well um so the, thinking about those as materials and how to put those materials and use those materials and make from those materials as a way of having a type of conversation with the world and, and contributing and participating and activating the world um, through making. Well, and that's so exciting. I know we were talking previously about Sherry Turkle's work and evocative objects um, and the existence of your work, uh, Mach 23, which is on view at the museum now as a uh, a really interesting object that exists in a couple different contexts or spaces and the theme of our exhibition season right now is objects. Um, could you tell us a little bit more maybe about how Mach 23 came to be and uh, the process of it? Sure, yeah. Um, so the, the, the story of this piece has evolved as I've gotten to know it and reinstalled it in, in different places. It's been in Missouri, it's been in DC, now it's been in Delaware, it's been in Pennsylvania. So it, it, it's changing as I work through um, the story of this piece and as I maintain it. Uh, so it, it came into being um, through just the idea of making. Um, I needed to make something. I had just moved from um, the Pacific Northwest to DC and uh, I had all these two by fours that were just sitting in the corner. Um, they were they were up for grabs and um, I just needed to start making. And so I had originally thought about how do how can I think about this material of, of wood and, and maybe stretch it like fabric what happens when I when I treat the wood like fabric and how would I do that uh, so I was thinking so I just started to cut up these two by fours reclaim two by fours um, which are pine and dug fir um, probably some of that material came from the Pacific Northwest because um, there's a lot of tree farming over there and basically I cut these pieces up into I saw these triangles and started to stack them and it created this this beautiful curve. Uh, and I thought, okay, so it's a flat curve right now. What happens when I make it three dimensional and throw so through a series through a process of cutting individually cutting these isosceles triangles and stacking them together, carving them, sanding them um, individually one at a time, i started to re like represent or not represent but become this uh, this form that that looks like you took the center and pulled it from the tip or pulled it from the the you pulled it from the center and it, it comes to a tip um, and then it started to take on a life of its own and it, it totally left that original idea that was just an idea to start the piece um, and so I started to carve the work and it started to become this tree-like form. And, uh, and, the, and, and as I tipped it over to install it, I, I saw the inside. I was originally gonna carve the inside, but I left it raw because it's this, it kind of reveals how it's made. And, and I think there's a, a nice uh, uh, 
balance between seeing this organic outside exterior and then entering into the inside and, and seeing the more geometric um, interior. Uh, so upon flipping it over, attaching it to a line, which then is attached to a wall, there's this, dyna this dynamic happening that, that fr is almost frozen in time. There's this tension between the wall and the piece. Um, and to kind of get at your question about what's the story of it, I, I've come to start to, right away when I, when I made it, I, I didn't know what it meant to me at that moment. I, it was really a process of making, it was a process of discovery. It was making through questions, thinking through making, which is kind of relates to what we're talking about with evocative objects is this process of meaning making through the act of making something. Uh, but as I've come to understand it through time, it really has felt like in the act of making, I was approaching home in the Pacific Northwest somehow, working with this material, rendering a tree like it's turned over, cantilevered with its root systems exposed. Um, and, and I don't know, whenever I see those root systems uh, turned over in the Pacific Northwest uh, with the tree cantilevered, there's just this magnificence to it and there's this I see my my home there I feel like I belong in those relationships that the trees um, create when they're in the forest and so that's somewhat in a way that I've started to understand this piece and then more recently upon installing it at the Delaware Contemporary Museum I've started to understand this piece uh, as an act of care and an act of maintenance um, Every time I install it, since the wood is unfinished uh, and it changes and morphs and evolves and cracks and is in a constant state of decay, um, if I'm not taking care of it, it wants to fall back into the ground and leave, its, leave the form that I've created for it. So when I install it, it comes in pieces and I have to carefully sand it, fill it, recreate this piece and almost like a puzzle with care Re recreate it. And so I think that there's something really beautiful in that act of maintenance that is really new to me right now and, and thinking about caring for caring for this object as, as a part of me. So that was a long winded explanation for that story, but the, I'm just kind of thinking through <laughs> all of these layers of the piece. I love it because there are so many layers there. I wrote down like four different things as you were talking about just the experimentation with a shape, like a triangle, which has this kind of mystic and ancient um, association too, and the building with a triangle and taking something that is mathematic and it becoming organic. And we think that there is such a divide between those two things, but mm -hmm. looking at specimens in nature, you can see, you know, mathematic shapes, perfect geometric shapes. Yeah. So that divide isn't as big as we think necessarily. And I think your piece kind of speaks to that a little bit too, when I hear you talk about it. Um, but also this idea that through the maintenance and care, there is a uh, new understanding and there's this element of destruction too. Do you, it's been reinstalled a few different times. Do you think that it over the life of the piece that it will go, that will become nothing? Will it go back to a different state or do you feel like you'll get to a place with it where it's a little bit more revered and you feel like, no, I'm not ready to let it go. That's what I'm dealing with right now. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I don't know. That's a good question. Part of me wants to just let it go. Part of me wants to be done with it. And part of me wants to really embrace this idea of maintenance. Um, because there's a relationship forming there. And within relationships, I believe that that's where meaning is held. Without this act of maintenance, the piece for me, it means nothing. And so in caring for the piece I'm caring for, my relationship to the piece, I'm caring for my story and history with the piece, I'm caring for your relationship as a viewer to this piece. And, and this piece's um, ability to inspire the awe that you're talking about, what we talked about before it was recording. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but there's this this like yeah i don't know I, I i have no idea how much you know with sculpture there's this functional element too is i i'm gonna have to store this piece and unless it sells let's sell it <laughs> <laughs> um you know and, and when it's in a climate controlled area there's it's gonna be fine but um when it's not seen by people when it's not um around people it starts to decay and i think there's a really interesting question there is like what what's our relationship as human beings in our care for the world like what happens to to, to the life of things if we don't care for them and maybe this act of maintenance is a practice in that and maybe i should push through that challenge Oh man, it's about to get real sticky. I think we're going to have, we're like in a zone of proximal development here with our conversation and understanding. It's going to get tough and then you're going to have the breakthrough. Um, because I think it's really interesting in general, the idea of art objects existing in the museum setting and what what each viewer brings to it and how you as the artist interacting with it and the making and then the seeing and thinking again gives it new meaning and mm -hmm. then as a visitor coming in and interacting with it i we bring new meaning uh and yeah. understanding to the pieces yeah um and so yeah. i think you know are there other objects in your practice that you feel like you're having the same struggle with or just in general like a you know museums existing for objects or for experiences is there an just a mundane object in your life that's a touchstone that you feel a similar uh struggle with i think it changes with the size of the object you know this thing is particularly large and and it's difficult to hold on to and maintain uh you know, with something as small as this giraffe given to me by my grandmother, uh, who I think, you know, it's a very cute giraffe, like looks up and tries to eat the plant there, you know, I could care for this thing my entire life. Um, it's a, it's a, and, and, you know, that's a representative object of an animal. So it's a human conception of what the animal's relationship is to the world. So there's a, that, that might be a different conversation, but, um, yeah, I mean, I think that it's important for public institutions to hold objects so that people can have transformative experiences with them. Not everybody's going to have a transformative experience with, with an object. Each object speaks to someone, people in a different way, but to center the experience of the visitors, um, I think is important within institutions um, like museums. Um, and then can you kind of repeat the was there a second part of that question i don't know it was kind of a rambling question <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean yeah i mean i don't know i think with other oh yeah i remember it was with other objects i have tiny little objects that i keep around me i, I collect things um where you know i might go on a hike somewhere i might pick up a rock a stone because there's an infinite there's an infinity and a history to a stone that caps captures my eye in a circumstance um, you know, me being at this given moment in time and place and this stone through the millions or billions of years that it's existed, being in this moment at a certain given time and place and, and us coming together, there's a beauty to that. Um, and, and that being there and that circumstance of me being there, both of those things coming together, I think, is what makes the world a little bit magical for me and mysterious. Um, you know, why did I pick up that rock? What's, what about that rock spoke to me? Or why did I pick up that branch? Why did I pick up that, um, that odd object that I can't really understand? Uh, that, so oh. yeah, there are things like actual nature objects that I keep with me. I think that's so interesting um, because I think a lot of times about contemporary art, but also historic collections, which is kind of my background, um, the art object as an artifact. And uh, sometimes we make that distinction between art and artifact, but also uh, the history of the, the object itself, like you allude to with the stone. It's been around what, if that stone could tell you its story, what would it say? And I think about that a lot of times 
uh, personifying objects and how the story of an object can connect us across cultures and time periods and really be a touchstone for um, understanding in a way. Yeah. Yeah. And you kind of talked about making the object to um, understand uh, something, feeling like, oh, I have to make because I need to make meaning of either my life or an experience. And that's really yeah. interesting um, yeah. to me. Or the material itself or the circumstance of the material or my relationship to that material or the material's relationship to the ecosystem. Um, when you talk about like these objects being able to tell a story of uh, intercultural relationships. I also am thinking about how can these objects tell stories? You know, they're historical objects. Uh, let's, you know, a rock that has history or, um, or like a mold or <laughs> like what happens if I start collecting like um, the, the mold that spots a maple? A maple tree it, it, it creates these beautiful black streaks in, in in maple what about those objects or subjects they have life what about them can tell us stories about their ecosystem non-human things and how can our learning about the relationship that the, the symbiosis and the relationship those things have to each other how can that help us relate to the world in a non-human centralized way where we become part of a much larger web of things versus at the top hierarchy. You know, we're, we're, we situate ourselves at the top. That's a, that's a myth, that's an illusion. There's no such thing. We exist in a web of, of interconnectivity and it becomes uh, obscured by uh, capitalism. It becomes obscured by the stories that, that we tell that have been told and retold um, and have formed a a reality around human existence. And so by looking at these smaller objects or these objects of nature or these objects of relationships, like how can we use these objects or ask these objects their story? And, and how can that story help us imagine different futures where, where that, that's based in, in relation, a relational way of being? Um, that that isn't uh, exploitative and isn't domination centered. That's a wonderful concept, and I'm glad that you um, you kind of touched on that, particularly um, that myth of humans at the top of the hierarchy there, because your your piece also reminds me of um, a book. I don't know if you're familiar with. I think it, I'm pretty sure it's called The Hidden Life of Trees or the Secret. You know, it's a, Have you so read funny. that? No, but I've been, it's been, it's like been like mingling in the background. Yeah. <laughs> to read it. <laughs> yeah. You, I think that you're really going to like it because it does, when we think about asking organic objects there or inorganic or, or thinking about the, the story or the interconnectedness of things, um, you know, that book is, is about somebody who cares for forests and understands the ecosystem that. of the forest, but also that there is this interconnectedness. When a tree is felled in a forest, it's not at, it doesn't die immediately, that the root mm -hmm. systems of other trees are continuing to give it life in a new way. And as it breaks yeah. down and it becomes part of the forest floor, what is it doing to that ecosystem and what is its lifespan there? Or that yeah. trees use their fungus and their root networks to send kind of quote unquote messages to each other. Um, yeah. It's a really interesting uh, interconnectedness um, among, yeah. among the, the system yeah. uh, in the forest. And that gets me back to your piece because it does reference that kind of organic nature of a felled tree or this, mm -hmm. the materiality as you touched on is organic. Um, yeah, you got to dig into that uh and and pick it up if you can um yeah that you'll get into it yeah absolutely it's been on my list i gotta get into it um and you know to recognize that these ideas aren't new they're actually very old and they've been in a in a state of erasure from colonialism and you know eurocentric ways of thinking so um 
how do we how do we listen to the people that have ha held these traditions and these ideas and beliefs at the center and how do we learn from them and and move forward and act, act as a you know there's all these questions that i'm thinking about it's and it's a challenge it's a practice to think in this interconnected way as well um because i'm often i often lose sight of it and i think again going back into the idea of making that that's a practice in being connected with the world. Well, and I, I just, I think uh, I'm so thankful to get a chance to have these conversations around the objects. I think that they give more insight and context for visitors that are able to come and see it in the museum. And you can also see exhibition uh, installation images online. And I did want to ask you also about uh, the second piece that you have in the exhibition um, that is not, it, it is sculptural, I think, but it's maybe less traditionally sculptural because it is on the wall. Could you talk a little bit about your other work? Sure, yeah. I, I, this is a more recent work. So uh, Mach 23 was made in 2016. This one was, Sefer is made in uh, 2020 in the spring. So it was a piece of the pandemic. Um, and yeah, so Sefer is a, means um, like book or references library in the Hebrew language. Um, and Basically, the way that it's made is it's cast paper. The, the, the actual process video is on my website. So you can look at that under drawings, paintings, under Sefer, and, and go down to the making of Sefer. Um, so it's, a ser it's, it's cast mulberry, Japanese mulberry paper uh, in this concave by about two inches surface. So when you look at it, the center is actually deeper uh, than the outside edges so the outside edges are closer to you and the inside center is farther away from you and it's very very subtle but it kind of warps uh, this drawing around you and that's why i consider it a sculptural drawing um and i also just think that everything is sculpture so uh, i'm a little biased but uh yeah it's it's a a, a process drawing where I was going, I was drawing a thousand circles or spirals. Uh, and, and that number references um, number in mis Jewish mysticism. And I wanted to get to this thing that I didn't know what I was getting to by engaging in this practice of drawing circles. Um, and so what happens is since I'm not using a, uh, a compass, I'm just using my hand, I'm using a tiny, tiny pen, and I'm only really allowing maybe a, a, millimeter, a millimeter or two between each line. Um, what happens is that I'm imperfect, and I make little shakes or movements in this drawing. And as I draw or make this mark through time, these accidents compound on themselves and eventually create unexpected undulations or movements or topography on the surface of the paper. And it's as if I'm creating a map or a universe or a library or a book that's telling a story um, of which I am the co-writer of because the universe, like the forces, the, like somebody might yell to me while I'm drawing in the studio and I might make a slip or um, a car might drive by or the wind might blow up and, and make me move or sometimes I just accidentally move because I'm an imperfect human being and so I'm essentially co-creating this universe in front of me with, with the material of the paper, the material of the ink and the outside forces and it's my, it was my job to listen to those forces and also balance my own desire to create a beautiful drawing um, and what ends up happening with this piece is through the act kind of with this Mach 23 and I think they respond really beautifully together and I had, would, had never even considered putting them together but through the act of making this it was centering it was meditative I lost my sense of self and I, and I started to enter into these these moments of 
differentiation or these moments of, of egoless space where I started to understand on a deeper level, like this is, sounds weird, but I really entered into this very intuitive understanding of the world when I was in this space about how we're creating our own reality and and you know that's intellectually has been said many times we're we're the, we're the authors of our own reality but the act of doing this thing was a really deep intuitive visceral knowledge and so what i what i was became really curious about was like how can just repetitive doing something teach you about the world uh, and that's something i'm still um navigating and still questioning because that's become really interesting to me. I love this, the story of that process. Um, and I've, I've talked about it before looking at that work about um, developmental psychologist Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi and his concept of flow and the mm -hmm. idea mm -hmm. that you get into this meditative space Space where you flow is where you're losing track of time or losing touch with the space around you. And, you know, um, it is the perfect intersection of skills and challenge. And so, you know, monks that are meditating or elite athletes um, or artists, people, musicians that are in this space um, experiencing flow and mm -hmm. Um, it's very interesting to me, like this, the process that can induce that. And then again, yeah. in your work, this understanding and this meaning making through the making of yeah. art, which I yeah. think is just really uh, a beautiful thread in yeah. both pieces in the show. And I love seeing them together. <laughs> I'm so thankful to you that uh, we were able to show your work at the museum, that we're able to have these conversations. Um, since we've been super philosophical, I'll leave you with a quote from uh, Adele Silver from the Cleveland Museum of Art. She says that museums are inventions of men, not inevitable, not eternal, not divine. They exist for the things that we put in them and they change as each generation chooses how to use and see or experience those things. And I hope that people will come um, and get a chance to see your work at the Delaware Contemporary. And I hope that we can keep these really awesome connections and conversations moving forward. So thank you so much for being with me today, Monroe. Yeah, thank you so much, Brittany. It was really, it was really nice talking with you about this. Thanks so much.